right. Aloha Inspired Moneymakers. We've got a great show in store. I'm excited that you are here with us live. Welcome to Financial Freedom Unleashed, episode number one of Inspired Money, the live stream series. I'm your host, Andy Wong. And today we're embarking on an exhilarating journey into the world of financial independence in early retirement. Are you ready to ignite your financial potential? Join us as we explore the allure and challenges of the FIRE movement, the emotional roller coaster of financial independence, strategies for success and potential pitfalls, the diverse paths to financial freedom across various life stages, and the profound impact of financial independence on lifestyle and personal fulfillment. I'm very excited because we have esteemed guest panelists today, Dr. Jordan Grummet also known as Doc G, Dr. Lakeisha Simmons, also known as Dr. Keisha, and Mariko Gordon, who we're going to have to come up with a nickname before this episode is out. We're going de to delve into uh, investment strategies, <laughs> mindful spending, and the psychological aspects of financial freedom. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the show. Welcome the panelists. Mahalo, and let the journey begin. Before we get started, I'm going to do just a quick intro of our panelists. Uh, Dr. G followed in his father's footsteps practicing medicine. Sadly, his father passed away unexpectedly in the prime of his life, a very profound loss that's given Dr. G a very unique perspective as a financial expert. He achieved financial independence, blogs about the subject, launched the award-winning Earn and Invest podcast, in his book, Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, mm. Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life, is one of my favorite books because it draws money lessons from the dying that come from Doc G's experience as a hospice doctor. So I'm sure we're going to get into that. Dr. Keisha Simmons is a first-generation college student. She earned her MBA and is a doctor of philosophy. She's founder of Brave Consulting, a women's empowerment firm focused on goal setting, leadership, soft skills, and financial freedom. She touches thousands of women's lives through her platform, Achieve Her. And she's appeared on Good Morning America, Business Insider, and People Magazine, among other places, telling her story of saving over $750,000 in four years and achieving financial independence at age 41. Mariko Gordon, built a $2.5 billion money management firm from scratch. She's an ACE analyst and portfolio manager specializing in small cap companies. She must be a professional juggler because she can simultaneously run a business, duke it out with Mr. Market and raise her family. Today, she mentors women who wanna start a business or turn their side hustle into a living they want to better manage their finances or work through a tricky patch in life or business. And I've actually had the pleasure of playing music when Mariko is dancing hula. So <laughs> that, that's a unique behind the scenes. Um, I didn't explain to our panelists, but we're going to be covering five segments. Those are the, the things that I highlighted in the intro. And this is how it's going to work. I'm going to cue the, the uh, segment by saying, let's jump into our first segment. Welcome to a world where financial freedom is a sought after goal, but is early retirement truly the path to fulfillment? In this segment, we'll explore the allure and the potential pitfalls of the financial independence retire early movement. While some have found joy in early retirement, others have faced a lack of purpose, meaning and unforeseen financial challenges. In an era marked by economic uncertainty and inflationary pressures, the ability to save and retire early may be more complex than it seems. We'll hear stories from both sides, those who've thrived and those who've struggled, and delve into the pros and cons of this approach to financial independence. Join us as we ignite a thought-provoking conversation on the realities of early retirement in today's world. Let's start with Dr. Keisha. You did not grow up with a lot of money but you found the FIRE movement, dove in head first, and achieved it. So can you start us off, just a little background of how you found FIRE? 
Thank you. Yes, you are right. Thank you so much, Andy, for having me on your show. I'm so excited to be here and share a little bit. And I look forward to learning from those on the panel today. I learned about FIRE really when I was in a downturn in my life. I was going through a divorce and I just went from a two family home of income down to one and I was strapped for cash. And so I was looking for resources online to help me save more, have a little more money in my pocket today and start really thinking about how, to, how do I save for my future? How do I become financially independent so I never have to worry about money again? And just doing some Google searching, that's how I learned about FIRE, actually. And you learned about it. How easy or hard has, or how easy or hard was it to like, live that lifestyle? Yes, that's a good question. People ask me, did you live on rice and beans? <laughs> well, guess what? I like rice and beans. But <laughs> so it wasn't, you know, that that challenging for me, because here's what I learned, what's important. And I want people listening to understand when you set your mind to a goal. So my goal was, I don't care if I, what does the disruption I go through, whether it's divorce, whether, you know, when I was growing up poor, or if I lose a job, you know, we went through COVID, no matter what happens, I want to financially be okay. That was my goal. So if that meant that I need to sacrifice and not get my hair done every week and not get nails done every week or certain things done that cost 70, 80, a hundred dollars at a time, I'm okay with that because I see a bigger goal. And if I, when I set my sights on achieving $1.25 million so that I can become financially independent, I thought to myself, that's a goal worthy of me sacrificing some smaller spending and me downsizing. I went from a really large five bedroom, four bathroom acre lot home down to an apartment so that I could reduce my expenses. And I was okay with that because I would, I saw the bigger picture. If I could achieve this 1.25 million, I can have cash flows from that portfolio to sustain me where I really don't have to work hard again. Doc G, how about you? You came at fire from a little bit of a different angle. You were a practicing physician. And you kind of figured out, oh, I am financially independent while you were working really hard and um, seeing patients. So I love what Dr. Keisha said, actually, because she found fire at a time of crisis in her life. And actually, I've been in the fire movement for a long time, and that's usually when people find fire is when something is stressful in their lives and they go down the rabbit hole and try to figure out well, how am I going to fix this problem I have? I also was in the midst of crisis. I was burned out. I was a practicing physician. I was lucky enough to have been brought up with financially savvy parents. So they modeled great financial behavior for me. I followed in their footsteps. So I saved lots of money and I invested money in the market and I bought real estate, but I had no idea what that meant. And I certainly had no idea what enough really looks like when it comes to money. And then fire found me a guy named Jim Dolly, uh, the white coat investor, had written a book called The White Coat Investor. It was for high net worth individuals like physicians, and it was to teach them about how to manage money. And I was writing a medical blog at the time, and he wanted me to review his book for my medical blog. He sent it to me. I read it. And all of a sudden, I had all these answers to questions that I didn't even know I had. It helped me frame what financial independence is and how to look at money in such a way that I can then start looking at my life and having enough to do what I want to do without necessarily working at a job that was now burning me out. Keisha also said another important thing, you know, a lot of this is kind of mindset, right? So you can be financially independent by the numbers or not financially independent by the numbers, but what's really going to separate you is the mindset of not only abundance, but starting to use whatever economic fuel you have to start doing the things you want to do. So we find that people who are very far from their fire numbers, right? That net worth, that means they're free. We find people who are very far from that fire number, but they have that financial independence mindset and they start doing the things they want to do today and building a financial framework around it. On the other hand, you had people like me who had plenty of money, but who didn't understand the mindset. So even though I had all this money saved in the bank, I had investments, 
that were giving me dividends and I was collecting rents, I didn't really have the right mindset to understand how to use that to live the life I wanted to live. Keisha mentioned goals. How did how does goal setting fit in for you? Because I feel like a lot of people approaching fire, they're just trying to spend as little as possible and then invest their savings so it'll grow. But how how specific do you need to be in your goal setting? So I think they're two different things, right? So when we talk about financial independence, one thing we're talking about is having enough money or having enough passive income in order not to work, right? So that's a very specific type of goal setting where you're trying to figure out that economic number. And there's lots of different ways to do that, which you guys know. There's something called the safe withdrawal rate, the 4% rule, this idea that you can withdraw 4% of your assets over 30 years of time and that you shouldn't run out of money. There's ways of looking at your monthly income. If you own rental real estate, for instance, do you have enough money coming in and rents to cover your monthly needs? So there are lots of ways to define those economic goals. What I find much harder is actually to start looking at those life goals. Like money is a tool that helps you to do other things. And a lot of us, especially in the fire movement, we get caught up in this idea of money as the goal. And so we spend all our time thinking about that. But ultimately, the next step or the next part of that evolution is actually to start looking at money as a tool that you then need to start using towards other goals. So the harder question always for me was not how much money do I need? It's what feels like purpose in my life. Once I started figuring that out, I can actually go back and reverse engineer the money to hopefully fit what I need of it. And in a sense, sometimes many of us can actually start building that purpose into our life before we hit that so-called financial independence number or goal. And so goal setting was hard for me because I realized I had enough money, but I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do with my life. I had been using money as an excuse to not search deeper into my soul and try to figure out what feels purposeful. So then I had to set out building some goals of, well, who do I want to be as a person? What looks purposeful? How do I want to spend the rest of my time if I don't have to be going to this nine to five, which is not filling me up anymore. Mariko, you work with women and helping them to improve their finances. What are some of the like first steps that you go through? Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm the bridge, not only the underachiever in the doctor department, but the underachiever in the fire department in that, you know, I just enjoyed doing what I was doing and the collateral damage was money. So that was awesome. But there was little intentionality around the building. So right in between the two of you. But when I, when I closed my business and retired, then I had the existential crisis because my identity like, you know, Doc G, what you're saying, it was like, that was the, the carrot, right? That was the business. And then boom, um, you know, then, then the marrying of the intentionality and, and, and how are you going to steward your resources? So I really love this conversation because we're talking about both. So to answer your question directly, Andy, <laughs> this is the risk with me is I won't do that, is um, that when I sit down with people, we really try to separate out where are they financially and then what do they want? So, so where's back to life purpose, where's intentionality? Because chasing money just because uh, isn't going to, there's no, it's not aligned action. There's no, your soul isn't connected to it. And I know many people who have millions and who, who, who don't feel safe and secure either. Right. So I think I think from day one, you have to weave into what's important to you. What are your goals? What are you willing to sacrifice for it? What are you willing to pursue for it? Or risks are you willing to take? And you have to have a very clear eyed view of how many works. Where are you now? You know, it has to be reality based and not wishful thinking. Um, and then I just feel like it isn't about uh, sacrifice now. And, and live your life later, that you should be living your life and, and your spending and your income generation congruently all along. So there, so, so you're, you're embedding your financial stewardship along with your life stewardship. And I think separating the two is, is, is a mistake. And I think our society tends to want us to do that uh, too, right? Not only our society, the FIRE movement really did that too. In the beginning, it was very much concentrate on money, make as much as you can so you can retire, and then you can live life. Um, yeah, exactly. Whereas I, I say, Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you should live life now. 
Yeah. And that's the fire movement has evolved. And that's why we see these new types of fire, right? Coast fire, slow fi, these ideas that maybe we can build in that intentionality, do the work you're talking about, which is some of that purpose and intention work early so that we can start building it into our lives now, um, which was very much not how the fire movement started. Yeah, I would say that was my beef with it. <laughs> As an analyst and investment manager, as a numbers person, do you have thoughts about financial independence, retire early? I feel like when we were in college, that's not, it wasn't a movement that existed or something that we thought about. I, I think, I think the idea, I think financial freedom is really important and, and which is not the same as retiring early necessarily, but I think the ability, what, what, what having money allows you to do is have choices. And I think, I think that that's the important, that's the important thing. And I think also, and rightfully so, I think there's a reaction against some of the sort of toxic, feral, you know, super hustle capitalism that's very extractive and everything. people are like, you know, I, I, you know, I have to live, but I also, don't want to get caught up in, in, in being, in, 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 in being that, right? So how can I, if I, you know, but if I have to work for the man, so to speak, right, how, how do I do it in a way I can live with myself and do it for as little as possible, right? But I really think it's about financial freedom. And I, I, I think sacrifices are easy when they don't feel like sacrifices. That's the thing. You know, and I think Dr. Keisha really, said it like you know when when you wanted to do it it was you just do it and i can chime in too because i i've loved everything that i've heard so far is we're all kind of in that same mindset and we're talking about how it's it truly is mindset because i i speak to so many women and men too who say oh i can't do that though you did it but you know i'm not a doctor i don't have a phd i you know i can't do that and it's really a mindset because even Dr. G said, well, yeah, I had the money, but I still didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing or how to do it. I, I didn't know. So it's a mindset, but I want to I wanna speak to values. And we talk about sacrifices and what it takes to save that money because the average person listening may not have PhDs and be a doctor and all that great stuff or be a financial planner. So I would say for the average uh, the person who's working hard and they're providing for their family and they still want to get to retirement, whether that's early or not, you know, they want to reach a comfortable retirement is what I'm hearing from so many people. I would say reassess your values, right? Think about your values. Think about the things that are truly important to you and the things that are not really that important to you. Think, of, think about your life as a whole. And if there was only three things you could do with your life or spend your money on, what would you spend on? Would you, you know, half the things you're spending on, you likely wouldn't be spending money on. So that's what I always tell people when it comes to sacrificing. If you have a goal that you're shooting for, it's going to be easier to sacrifice. And number two, are your, is your spending aligned with things you value? small things that we don't think are adding up. And I know people say, oh, coffee is not a big deal, but that's just an example of things in your life. Do you truly value it? Is that something that you value so much that you'd be willing to spend a thousand dollars on it? You know, how, and then once you kind of reassess and say, you know what, it's not really that big of a deal. It's just because I'm rushing in the morning. So if I just take a little extra time in the evening, you know, or is it really important for me to live in the city? Not really. I prefer to live on the outskirts of town. And guess what? Rent's a thousand dollars cheaper, 20 minutes away, you know? So it's just changing that mindset to say, okay, where can I make cuts where it doesn't really impact my life in terms of my values and how I spend my time and the people I'm around and the experiences that I have. And then it's easier to make those adjustments. Yeah, 100%. I love it. Um, let's um, go to segment two. Emotions can run high on the road to financial independence. It's a path filled with triumphs and trials, hopes and fears. In this segment, we'll delve into the emotional complexities of this journey, from the exhilaration of cutting ties with debt to the existential questions that financial freedom can raise. 
we'll explore the psychological landscape of this life-altering pursuit. Witness the emotional roller coaster and see how it shapes the lives of those who dare to ride. Dr. G, I want to start with you because once you achieved financial independence, you you really went through an identity crisis almost. I certainly did. I mean, when I realized I was financially independent, I, I kind of read this book and I looked at my numbers and I said, oh, this thing that I've been worrying about, I'm actually there. The reason why I went through identity crisis is I had spent so much time and energy trying to figure out how to get out of the life I didn't want to be in, that I had no idea what a new life could look like. And so I was burned out in medicine and I was ready to leave. And that was around 2014. I actually didn't fully leave medicine until 2018. It took me four years of dealing with some of the stress and anxiety and then rebuilding a sense of identity as I stepped away from being a physician, which is something I dreamed about since I was a little kid and started getting comfortable with this idea of there were other things that helped define me and those other things fit me more comfortably. Like I had never questioned this idea that when I went out to the hospital to see patients, I hated hanging out in the doctor's lounge. Or when I went with my wife to a party and I met new people, I felt embarrassed to tell them that I was a physician because I never understood it until I realized that that identity that I had been wearing around me like a cloak was no longer fitting me. And it was on the outside, but on the inside, I had this whole different identity, that of a podcaster and a writer and a communicator, someone who wanted to have these deeper conversations that fit me a lot better. But in order to get to that place, I had to go through that crisis. I had to feel the panic and anxiety. And I think a lot of people, especially in that early fire movement, went through the same thing because they had spent so much time concentrating on money that they didn't think about all those other things. So I call it the money mind meld in my book, this idea that we get so caught up in the mirage of wealth that we miss that it actually shields us from thinking about those other deeper, more important things. And the reason why we do that is thinking about money is really easy. Like it's not easy to become financially independent, but it's easy to find out what the steps are and then start following them. What's much harder is to ask yourself, well, what kind of life do I want to live and who do I want to be? And if money were not an issue, how would I spend my time? That kind of freaks people out to think about those things. It's yeah. scary. It's big. There are no easier concrete answers. It makes us think a lot about mortality because ultimately at some point you say, oh, there's these big important things that are out there. And if I don't pursue them now, there'll be an end one day, right? That life is finite and I might not reach these things. So it's much easier to say, well, why don't I concentrate on money and get to that net worth? But that's going to create some psychological issues when you get closer and closer to that net worth and then have to face those difficult life issues. And so one of two things happens. People get closer and closer. They make more money and more money. And so they avoid the issue altogether by just deciding that the real goal is to have double the amount of money they have accrued because it's so much easier to think about that than actually start thinking about what your purpose in life is. Or the exact opposite happens. People get to this vaunted height of a net worth that they want, and they suffer from loss aversion, the fear that all of a sudden the market's going to change and they're going to lose it all. And they actually get doubly worried that they're going to lose what they have as compared to how worried they were about accumulating in the first place. So there's all sorts of psychological pitfalls. And again, the whole reason comes back to the point is that money is a tool. And so when we make it a goal, it causes all sorts of problems because we're ignoring what's truly important to us. But if we can, from the outset, start looking at it as a tool to accomplish more important things, we then go into this whole process with a much healthier view. And because of that, if you start there, most people don't actually want to retire. They What they really want to do is actually create a job that's more in alignment with their purpose. Not that they want to retire, not that they don't want to ever make money again. They just want to have much more control of how they spend their time every day and they want to do things that fill them up. I would agree with that 100%. Dr. Gene, you hit the nail on the head. And not only that, people, I think also people need a short break, right? They want a short break. Because people come to me and they say, oh, I'm just exhausted. I'm just so tired. I need a break. I need a break. I need like a year off. But I, I think you're right. They still have a passion. And I, the same thing happened to me when I didn't have to work. But I'm thinking, okay, I'm taking care of my children. I'm taking care of my husband. I'm cooking every day. I'm exercising the best shape of my life. But something's missing. And my soul still has more to give. 
what can I do to give? But I needed, I desperately needed a break. And that's why I quit working. I was like, I quit. I'm done. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm done. But I just needed a break. And that, then I had that break. It's like, okay, what is my soul on fire for now? Yeah, it's like a mini retirement or a sabbatical mm -hmm. as opposed to full retirement. Because I just don't think many people really in the end retire. Yeah. I know so many stories of people who did the fire thing, proclaimed it out to the world. And a year or two later, they were back to doing something industrious. It might have been something completely different, but they were doing something. Yeah, I would add a couple of things. One is that, to your point, Doc G, that um, the energy that goes in getting money, right, is very different than the energy that gets the behind keeping money. And some people have a have a really have a hard time <laughs> making that transition. That it's very easy when you're chasing the rabbit, and then you have the rabbit, and you're like. Oh no, now I have the rabbit. <laughs> it's a different kind of set of responsibilities. And and it can trigger a whole bunch of anxiety that you didn't have chasing the rabbit because when you're chasing the rabbit, you're chasing the rabbit. I mean, you know, you know what you need to do and, and you're chasing the rabbit. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, you know, now what do I do? And 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 it gets and then you have a fear that that you're to your point that you're gonna lose everything that you've built. And of course, right? Uh, um, you know, nothing is certain, but, but, uh, but uncertainty, right? <laughs> you know? So navigating, you end up also having to navigate other sort of your inner motivator uh, as, as well. And the other thing I think too, is that a lot of wealth is invisible, right? Like we don't really know, right? But what we can see are the status signaling, right? We can see what people are living in or driving and, 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 and or have that freedom. And I think that ends up being what people want. But to Dr. Keisha's point, right, is it really what's going to light your soul on fire? Or really, if you want the freedom that to light your soul on fire, you know, it's the invisible wealth. And nobody, you know, we don't compare notes on the invisible wealth, right? Um, and and the power of of just compounding over time, the not messing with it, and and but I also feel like it's important to have a healthy attitude towards towards the generation of income and the preservation of capital, and 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 to be intentional uh, about it because I think if you end up in a deprivation state for a long long time, you're 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 gonna bust out and it's it's gonna be ugly. You know? <laughs> So I think it's important to lead an intentional life where, you know, I was talking with this with a client the other day, you know, you, 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 you're, 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 you're a young dog, you, you come along and you're living in a house where everything is hand me down and because you're like really focused on, on paying all the, you know, all the student debt and things. And it's like, maybe, maybe you should spend a little, you know, to, to have your house reflect the person that you are now and and enjoy that have that comfort when you come home and and in you know obviously contextually appropriate right uh and not go crazy <laughs> at cb2 or a restoration home or whatever but but where you feel like oh, i don't have to live with college dorm room furniture anymore and i would like to feel good and feeling good spending money to feel good in a way that's going to allow you to actually make more feel happier be more connected to yourself not be in a deprivation state is is psychologically very, very healthy. So on paper, on the spreadsheet, you know, you might be minus ten thousand dollars, but in your soul ROI, you know, and you're and you're kind of reinforcing the person you it's 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 an investment too. Because if you come home and you're just like depressed, that's not gonna be good too, right? If on the other hand, you're like, I'm doing college dorm room for five more years and it's all very intentional. But if you're starting to feel the stirrings of not lifestyle creep, I'm really not talking lifestyle creep here, okay? I'm really talking like all parts of you, your soul, your mind, your heart, you know, they wanna be on the same level of development, right? We don't wanna be, we wanna be emotionally mature at the same time that we're intellectually mature. And I think, I think there's a kind of financial maturity that goes with that too. And again, I'm not advocating lifestyle creep at all, but I just mean, that's what I mean about being in right relationship with 
with this ecosystem that's your money. And and I really see it that way, right? Where your your assets, your liabilities, your income, your expenses, your money lineage, all your ancestral traumas that are handed down to you, and and your future casting, right? And and that's very important for all of this to be integrated and whole. But it has to nurture your whole all aspects of your being, I think. I'm I'm a really big believer in that. Yeah, holistic. It sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> you you develop a lot of self awareness in the process. <laughs> Some of which is very painfully come by. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that this fire subject, I mean you, one thinks that it's about money, but it 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 encompasses so much more and does require that introspection and knowing oneself and knowing what one wants and what's enough. Um I, I want to go on to uh, segment three and then maybe have Mariko kick us off because she she's the professional investor among us. Strategies and pitfalls, opportunities and obstacles. The path to financial independence is a delicate dance between risk and reward. In this segment, we'll uncover the tools that can lead to success and the traps that can derail dreams. From high yield savings to the impact of inflation, we'll provide a comprehensive look at the financial landscape. Watch as we navigate the fine line between prosperity and peril, offering insights that empower and enlighten. I love that, the fine line between prosperity and peril. (laughs) I can feel my anxiety shooting up right there. (laughs) The drama. So did you want me to, to, to comment or you have a question, Andy? <laughs> how do you, when you're working with your clients or even as a professional investor, there's so many ways to invest. So like, what is your general view for most people? And then it can be very different if you look individual to individual. Yeah. Um... So there's some basic tenets of sort of, you know, of investing that I think, I mean, I I think everybody should understand these sort of basic frameworks. Um, I think it really, I think where I see people um, getting derailed is um, classically not letting the power of compounding happen, trying to time the market. Um, uh, So too much activity, too much either too much diversification, like in the duplicative way, or too much concentration. Um, I think dollar cost average, like this is the other thing, you have to be like a firefighter, you have to be willing to run into the fire, right? So when the world looks like it's going to pieces, and the market's falling to pieces, like that's the time when you're, you know, you're gradually deploying capital, you're going to be um, uh, so much better off, but, but we're social animals, right? When everyone is losing their heads around us, it's very hard for us to go, you know what, I'm just going to keep putting, you know, the $500 a month I put away in the market every, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing that. Right. But it's, um, I think Morgan Housel calls it, or Napoleon called it like the, or, the, the, doing the ordinary thing when everybody, you know, during extraordinary times kind of a thing. So I think there's some basic things like that. I think where people go wrong often is, um, not trying to make it more complicated, trying to beat the system, having a little bit of a, of a, of a lotto mentality. This would be like mean stocks trying to get rich quick kind of a thing. And I think for a lot of, and I'm going to speak to sort of, you know, the sort of middle of the, you know, just your average retail investor, like whose hands you entrust your money in uh, matters a lot. And uh, I, you know, I, I, Personally, I get scandalized at some of the stuff I see. I mean, I'm like, how do, can people look at themselves in the mirror and do this to their clients? But they do. So uh, learning how to discern who's safe hands or not. And also, you know, really low cost, efficient indexing ETFs. I have no problem with target date funds. I think for the average person, do it, put it in there, dollar cost average, and 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 also have different uh, um, you know, different kind of sort of 
cisterns of, of money. If there's a sort of mattress money that you're never going to look at that you can invest in really aggressively, depending on your long term horizon, things where you can also save and but not with a specific purpose necessarily, and you can let that compound. And and I think you can also have fun if you're somebody who really enjoys trading or you really enjoy doing whatever. Take a small amount of your capital and go to town because you'll scratch that itch. You'll have all the fun. But meanwhile, the rest of it's politely compounding and you're keeping your mitts off of it. You know? <laughs> and, and so I, I highly recommend Morgan Housel's book, The Psychology of Money. I think that that's something that everybody should read. Uh, and, and at least you'll understand how, how not to be your own worst enemy, I think. That's great advice. And I, I've seen similar things that you're talking about. In fact, just this weekend, a very close friend was texting me and asking, what's a good website to look up the fees of different mutual funds? Because he has a friend that has an account with a company. And he said the ticker symbols were so long that he just suspected that they're these proprietary products with very high fees. And um, I told him, go to Morningstar. You can plug it in. You can see the fees. Otherwise, just send me a list and I can generate something for him. But yeah, there are still crazy things going on on out there, even though we've seen fees coming down a lot, which is good for, for everybody. We see 0% commissions. We see low cost ETFs and index funds. There are many, many ways to invest very inexpensively. And you could just be investing like $5 a month when you start and it's okay. Yeah. It's, that's the thing is to get the habit. I think it's very important to get a habit, get the plumbing so the cash flows. And you, so you're not having to make cognitive decisions. You're not having to make decisions. It's automatic. And, and, and then you're not, when the markets are bad, you're not sitting there going, should I, should I not? You're just having this flow going in for long-term money. Obviously, if you're going to working on the deposit for a house in the next two years, that's a different story. But I also want to tell you one thing I do kind of for fun, which is sort of twisted of me, but I do go to these free retirement dinners and, and seminars. Uh, where, where, oh no, we're trying to educate you about retirement, but really we're like closet trying to sell you variable annuities or annuities. Mm -hmm. And, and really, cause I can, I know where the line of the law is, right. And they are walking that line very fine, but man, the psychological manipulation, the fear mongering, I mean, of course, everyone's going to go screaming out of that room you know, and into the arms of an annuity salesman. And it just makes me nuts because these, you know, you're, you're, it's just really like, it's just not okay, but people get away with it. Um, and so this is where I think, even if you think capitalism stupid, if you think money is like shallow, just there's a basic level of education that I think the same way there's a basic level of education about your health, right? Just out of your own self worth and self respect, just, just try to learn that. There are so many ways to learn it in ways that are not awful and jargon filled. And, and it's worth doing that because you got to calibrate your bullshit meter. <laughs> Doc G, you have an audience of people who want to retire early, they want financial independence. What common challenges do you see that are recurring? And what do people need to be mindful of? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to actually de-escalate the conversation a little bit. And I, I take a lot of this from Nick Majuli, who wrote a wonderful book called um, Just Keep Buying, um, and his website is Of Dollars and Data. So there are a few things to know. I mean, most investments actually go up over time, right? So if you are a long-term investment, and especially if you're at all diversified, most likely your portfolio is going to rise. The other thing is if you keep buying in high markets, low markets, flat markets, if you just continuously keep buying all the time, you are going to accumulate a lot of wealth. So as long as you don't have anything sucking the value out of your investments, and that's where we get to what you guys were just talking about, like, for instance, high fees or high advisor fees, et cetera. Once you get past that, the grand majority of people, people who have a portfolio, right? Someone who actually has a portfolio of investments, who listens to podcasts like this, or who is thinking about these things or reading any of these books, the grand majority of those people are going to die with more money than they need. 
Running out of money is very unlikely for people who actually pay attention to their portfolio and who continuously invest over long periods of time. So the truth is, I'd like to turn the conversation around. The pitfall is worrying about being perfect when all you really need to be is good or even just average. Like if we can just get people to buy reasonable investments with low fees over long periods of time, we are going to have so many millionaires and multimillionaires, we're not going to know what to do with them. Human nature will not allow that to happen. But the first thing that we often talk about in my audience is, look, dude, you don't need to be perfect. You've got to be consistent and reasonable and let time and compounding do the rest. The stock market is a fantastic, amazing thing. Most stock markets, even around the world, go up over long periods of time. So if you have a trajectory, if you have the time period, you're almost assured to win if you can get the behavior down correctly. Mm -hmm. I, a Dr. thousand Keisha percent. is a living example. Uh, she achieved it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, For sure. you, you accumulated a million dollars at a relatively young age. Did you mm -hmm. keep things simple? Very simple. At one point, I did step out there. I got a little too cocky. <laughs> and uh, I was actually having an interview today and the reporter, I was telling them one of my mistakes was getting on this train. There was a tech ETF. And I was like, oh, yeah, I should just, you know, put some money there. And I lost big time. I mean, over half the value of what I had invested gone. And never came back. I mean, I was try. I went to look when I sold in early 2022, and I mean, here we are at the end of 2023, and it's less than what it what what it was when I sold. So, just I think for even though I am a numbers person, I'm an I have a PhD in analytics, you know, but I I learned my personality is to stick with simple. And index funds has a history. And I think for the average person just starting out or even not, if you're busy being a doctor, you know, saving lives or delivering babies or, you know, being an accountant, whatever it is that you do, we know that the stock market, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, it has a history. The NASDAQ, it has a history. And no, history does not predict the future. But we can use some of that to help us versus some new cutting edge tech ETF or fund or whatever, you know, that sounds so beautiful and it's going to make me a gazillionaire, you know, it's, and then it doesn't happen and you're like, oh. so yes, I definitely believe for me anyway. And for, I think a lot of people, they want simple, they want something they can understand. They understand that Coca-Cola is sold on the stock market. They know that. And we understand Companies we know and love, we can easily track Caterpillar. How did Caterpillar do this quarter? You know, and that's in the, the Dow Jones. And so just breaking it down into every day, where are you shopping and what are you buying and what do you believe in and, and what companies and th there's, a, there's a simple recipe to that. As my colleagues here on the line have said, it's consistency. It's putting some money in early. Or uh, if you're starting a little bit later, if you feel like you're starting late, which a lot of people are, if they are starting later, then you just find those ways, as we said before, to cut in some areas so that you can have more to invest. Because if you're starting later and you can invest more than that standard 10 or 15, or even if some are saying 20% now, if you can invest more than that, then yes, your money's gonna compound and grow faster. Right. Oh, because you need time. So if you have less time, you have to put more money in. But you can do it. You've done other things that were hard. You've done other things that were challenging. Right. And I always tell people that you've done something that was hard. You've done something that pushed you, that stretched you. And you can do this, too. And trust me, it is worth it. It is worth the investment. It is worth the time. It is worth any little sacrifice that you may make so that you can enjoy and reap the benefits of it later. Well, that's the perfect segue into our fi final segment. Imagine a life unbound by financial constraints, where passions are pursued, dreams are realized, and communities are enriched. In our final segment, we'll explore the profound impact of financial independence on lifestyle and personal fulfillment. Through the stories of early retirees, 
we'll uncover the joy and challenges of a life lived on one's own terms. Continue to watch as we journey into a world where money is a tool, not a tether, and discover what it means to truly be free. Earlier, Dr. Keisha talked about, sometimes you just need a break. Like, how do you know when you want to pursue fire versus when you just need a sabbatical? Well, that's a great question. If you're experiencing burnout and you may be still in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, you may just need the break. But I think the important thing to understand is Many people know that they need a break. However, they don't have the finances to take the break. They don't have the reserves. They don't, they hadn't been putting away more than what traditional wisdom would say 10 or 15%. You know, if I'm being generous, someone may have said 20%, if I'm being generous, right? So if you've been just putting away 10% for, you know, 10 years or so, you may not feel comfortable with taking that break because you may not have enough invested. But I would say, I, I think it should be commonplace for us to be able to take a career sabbatical. I'm a PhD and in, I, as a tenured professor, when I was a professor, uh, as a tenured professor, that, that was one of the benefits. We are awarded a sabbatical once every seven to 10 years. And let me tell you, <laughs> That was like a breath of fresh air to have five or six months off and still receive your pay so you can keep your same standard of living, but step away to rest. This country is not about rest. It's about work. And I think so many of us need a break. Well, I, I'm, I'm advocating for both a sabbatical, career sabbatical, and a daily siesta, but that has not happened yet. Doc G, I think you wanted to weigh in. You know, I was just going to say that I, I, I think the either or proposition doesn't work. Um, are we going after fire or are we taking a sabbatical? I think the bigger question is, are we living the life we want to lead? And then we can kind of work both of those things in, right? So... You know, an example I often give when I wrote, I wrote about in my book is a gentleman who I call for the book Ernesto, but he was a patient of mine. I'm a hospice doctor, so I was taking care of him at end of life. He was dying of leukemia in his 40s, but in his 20s, he took a sabbatical to go climb Mount Everest. And he took a whole year off. He trained half the year. He went to go climb it. He made it about halfway up. The weather changed. They had to come back down. He went back to work and continued in his career. And of course that year did take something away. Like he was climbing up the corporate ladder. It slowed him down. He might've missed out on some experiences, but on his deathbed in his forties, all he wanted to talk about was his trip to Mount Everest. So we make it an either or proposition, but I think what we have to really do is say, well, what is life and how do I want to live it? For Ernesto living life, was going to try to climb Mount Everest in his 20s. And thank God he did, because he would have never gotten a chance in his 40s when he got sick and died. So the idea is not to put off life, but to live it today. And then we can build our finances around that. So you don't have to go for fire. You don't have to go for some net worth number. What you need to do is start thinking about how money is going to serve you and not just money, but all those other tools you have, like your youth and your time and your passions and your connections. How are all those gonna, things going to serve you to live the life you want to live? And so if I think if we start with that, if we start with purpose, then the money questions tend to fall in place because then it just becomes a simple question. Like, do I have enough money to support myself to take these six months off? Yes, that might mean I work a few years longer at some point in the future, but that trade-off might be worthwhile for you. I love what you were saying. And I would also say it's a lot that you don't necessarily know your purpose. Like, because I think sometimes people can get stuck looking for the purpose. Like they, there's, it's like back to the perfection, right? Like you got to have, find the purpose. And I think part of finding the purpose is in the doing and exploring and the trying different things too. And having some compassion and grace for yourself in that process. But this idea of living a fully integrated life and that all of your resources, that you were tremendously resourced, uh, our inner resources, you know, our capabilities and, and that we should it's it should be a fully integrated life and 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 then the decision tree 
is very simple to your point. You know, if I want to do a certain thing, it's really obvious how much money I, I need, quote unquote, yeah. right? I don't want to understate this point because you, you brought it out that this idea that actually finding your purpose is not always, always easy, the easiest thing. And in fact, there is such thing as purpose anxiety and studies show that 91% of people at some point in their life have purpose anxiety. On the other hand, we also know this, uh, the medical studies show that people with a sense of purpose live longer, are healthier mm -hmm. and are generally happier. So actually this is, is going to be the subject of my next book, but there's a little bit of a paradox around purpose. And so we have to get smarter about how we look at purpose itself too, and have to start working on that anxiety ridden part of it, uh, and minimizing that so that purpose can do all those great things that it does for us uh, without actually making us upset. I mean, I think half the reason people concentrate on things like fire is because they have purpose anxiety and want to put it off. It's the rabbit. Financial independence retire early. It's this movement that people either think about their following or not following. But it sounds to me that fire gets you to think about money and talk about money which is something that everybody should be doing. So it shouldn't really be a movement. This is like people need to be thinking about purpose and money and retirement and investing. These are like foundational aspects of a successful life. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'm curious. I'm curious. I, can I ask a question, Andy? Is that okay? I love Absolutely. to get I love to get the feedback. What are some what are some ways? I mean, what what do we do to help those? Because let's face it, there's a large population who is paycheck to paycheck, struggling in this country, mm -hmm. are not at all prepared for retirement, let alone in early retirement. Okay. How do we, what, what do we need to do in this country to start preparing those in school or younger or uh, right out of high school? Or what, what do we need to start doing to prepare and change those mindsets around, yes, purpose, so doing work you love early on so that you don't get stuck in a career that you don't like or in a job that you don't want, but you have to do it because you need to put food on the table. And so then you're stuck in this conundrum and you can't get out of it. You can't stop and go back to school or, or it's really hard. Once you've got settled, you have children, you've got to put food on the table. Maybe you didn't get the degree that you wanted to get. What, what do we do? Where do we start? How do we, what, how do we help people? Yeah. I mean, you know, the problem is just, you're trying to unspill the milk. Right. Mm. So we are messaged on who we should be and what we should do, both financially and otherwise, from the day we're born, whether it is our parents telling us we should be doctors when we grow up or it's advertising agencies creating a picture of what the good life looks like so they can sell us their products. Or if it's Instagram showing us the newest clothes we should be wearing or the vacations we should be taking, we are pretty much programmed to follow other people's belief of what purpose is, whether that's because they want to show us how great a life they're living or it's an advertiser trying to sell us something. And so it's really now hard to undo the world we've created where purpose is being defined for us. And it part of the problem is we're telling people that they need to go find their purpose by watching Instagram or getting taken in by these commercials, where what we should really be telling them is that they have to start creating their purpose. Purpose is something that you actually create. And the way you do that is you have to start looking at what specifically speaks to your nature. So there's lots of different ways to do this, right? A few quick examples. In hospice, we do a life review with the dying. It's a series of questions about people's lives, what was important to them, what were the biggest accomplishments, what were their biggest failures, what were the people in their lives that were important to them, what do they want to accomplish in the little bit of life they have left. So conducting a life review now as a young person actually is a great way to connect with what's been purposeful in your life. That's one way. Another way is to look back at childhood. I mean, most of us have things in childhood that lit us up that we eventually let go of because we were told that you don't do that for a living or that's a kid thing and not an adult thing. Another thing is to look at your jobs. Most people, even if they hate their jobs, can find one little piece they love. And so you start thinking, well, why do I love that piece of my work? And what does that mean about me? Am I finding purpose in that? 
there are a bunch of other ways, but last but not least, there's the spaghetti against the wall method is you, if you truly have no idea what purpose means in your life, you try a bunch of things. You say yes to a bunch of experiences. You throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Um, I mean, those are just some really quick, simple back of the napkin ways to start looking at purpose and how you can start thinking about your own purpose. I, I think those I would add awesome. good yeah. notes. <laughs> Yeah. Dr. Keisha, I think maybe also too, one thing to think about is that there's a lot of systemic shit out there that yeah. we were very like, oh, the individual can do it all. Right. But like sometimes like we need to 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 really work on some of the things that make it uh, uh, that really create the conditions under which you have millions and millions and millions and millions of people on an economic treadmill right whether that that they can't they 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 can't however well intentioned or psychic that it's really really hard to to have the luxury of 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 purpose in a way although you can always make your purpose and how you live your everyday life it's in it's in your purposes in here but um i i think that that's something that we need to do because you know if you don't have the 20 bucks to 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 put aside you know but in, and it's the sort of being able to do whatever small thing matters and small things compound into great things for sure. But I think we also need to look at, at, at and it's, this is really hard, right? Because we can't put it all on the, on the shoulders of the individuals. And yet we have very powerful structures. How do we dismantle them or, or, or change them and, 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 you know, kind of create a, it, cause it's right education is tied into people's opportunity set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, and I, I don't know what the answers are. I, I just know that, that it's, it's bigger than the individual, than millions and millions and millions of individuals too. And I, I, I don't know where to start chipping away at it. I mean, you know, I do, I try to do what I can, but that's a very I'm real wrap thing. It up. Lakeisha, it's a big question, mm -hmm. and it reminds me of something that my father told me. He said he loved reading about Mother Teresa and read a lot of her books. And he told me that many people would ask Mother Teresa, how is it that you can help and touch millions of people impacting their lives? And her advice was just focus on your family. Just take care of your family. Don't think about changing the world. You just have to start at home. And then from there, you go to your community. And eventually it grows. But I, you're right. There's a very large problem with a lack of financial literacy. And people need help. So I think this group here, everyone is doing their part uh, to spread the money gospel and to help people. So I want to thank you all for joining me for this financial freedom discussion. Thank you for joining us on this live stream, whether you're watching live or you're watching on recording. Visit Dr. Keisha at LakeishaSimmons.com. You guys made this easy for me. Doc G is at JordanGrummet.com and Mariko is at MarikoGordon.com. So you, thank you guys for just uh, putting your names and we'll put that in the show notes and i encourage everyone to go visit i know that mariko is even doing some workshops and tying it into a maui fundraiser mm -hmm. so go to go to marikogordon.com and check that out thank you guys for joining me and um i hope that we can do it again thank, thank you so much thanks thank you thank you nice to meet you guys